Innovation Rockstars. Innovation Rockstars. In this episode, we are joined by the seasoned entrepreneur and innovator Bob Petrie, Director of Innovation at City Ventures. Hi, and welcome back to Innovation Rockstars. My name is Chris Mirod, and in this episode, I am excited to welcome Bob Petrie. Bob is Director of Innovation at City Ventures, uh, responsible for running the innovation program at and incubating new business within City Ventures, grinding all day long as I learned from you. Bob, thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure having you. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. All right. So as always, we start right away with a short 60 seconds introduction sprint. It's all about you, your career and your role at City Ventures. So for the next 60 seconds, the stage is all yours. Let's go, Bob. Great. Uh, so I am Bob Petrie. I work for City Ventures uh, and I've been at City Ventures for about four and a half years. And during that time, I've run different elements of an innovation incubator uh, inside of Ventures. And the goal of the program is to work with the greater city group organization and to provide resources to attack new market opportunities, to deal with disruption, uh, to develop product concepts, uh, to work with interesting partners. Um, I've been doing that for four and a half years, but prior to that, I spent about 18 years in the startup world. So I've co-founded two companies. I was an early member of another five or so, usually as a COO or a chief product officer. And during that time, I've worked with probably 13 digital product management processes. Uh, I've uh, gone through about 11 different funding events and probably seven mergers and acquisitions. So City Ventures hired me as an entrepreneur in residence to inject that entrepreneurial spirit and that entrepreneurial uh, mindset. So a lot of experience, entrepreneurial mindset and still grinding all day long. That's great. All right. Mm -hmm. So as a next thing, um, I have prepared three sentence starters for you and I would like uh, to ask you to complete those sentences. Um, so let's start okay. and let, let's see. Let's see what you say. Uh, number one, uh, grinding means Grinding means, uh, and this is uh, not everybody's startup experience, but it's most of my startup experience, most of my corporate innovation experience, and most of the startup people I've worked with. It's grinding it out, ex you know, going after a market opportunity, uh, developing products, trying to find product market fit, uh, and just really trying to put everything on the table in order to find that opportunity that you've been seeking. Uh, and sometimes it takes months quarters or even years of just grinding it out and trying to kind of find that elusive uh, elusive win uh, which is sometimes hard to find of course it is all right perfect okay number two innovation is yeah everybody's got a different innovation definition uh, and this is kind of my flavor and i don't want to cast shade on anybody else's uh else's definition because there's a room in that innovation ecosystem for uh, for everybody right uh, but my approach to innovation and the way i define it uh, is that innovation is all about develop, developing a capability to allow a business to go after new market opportunities, especially in cases where they don't necessarily have the right resources at the time. Maybe they don't have the right mindset to go after that opportunity. Uh, maybe the risk reward equation just doesn't make sense because there's a lot of uncertainty um, or potentially that attacking that market opportunity has to happen in a time frame that's different than typical business cycles. And so innovation is the capability to go after those opportunities. Okay, understood. That's a great, great, great description, actually a great definition, if you will. Okay, and finally, number three. And, and, and honestly, Chris, can I just add one sure, more thing? Another, sure. kind of, another part of the flavor for me anyway, is making sure that there's always going to be economic impact right. to those innovation efforts, right? right. Uh, and and I, I'll put it, put it in quotes in a reasonable time frame. So for me or for us, it's generally, we want to have that impact yeah. anywhere between two and five years. Like we're not looking for moonshots that may take 10 years to develop. And we're not looking for like quick wins that I could get up and running in a quarter. Uh, it's something that's going to have impact, but it's undefined when that's going to be. So that's the equation. All right. I'm definitely going to take this down. <laughs> um, okay. Mm -hmm. And finally, number three, um, Bob, uh, the last thing I did before leaving the startup world was... Oh, uh, that was a uh, what I consider a startup turnaround. Mm. Uh, so this wasn't necessarily my baby, but the investors brought me into a company that had a lot of promise, but was lacking some of the maturity required to kind of maintain kind of operations. And so I was brought in, you kind of call it the gray hair, uh, because a lot of the experience <laughs> that I had, 
Uh, and when I joined, there was maybe three months of cash left in the uh, the bank oh, wow. account. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I can't even believe how or why I took the risk at the time. Uh, but I came on board. We've restructured the organization. We've restructured the product. Uh, we changed the um, acquisition funnel, uh, and we took on a little bit more money. And then uh, fairly quickly, I got them to cash flow positive and bought that company the time and the space and the breathing room uh, in order to kind of uh, figure out what they wanted to do next. Yes, so that was my last opportunity. Sounds like a lot of fun, but at the same time, obviously a lot of uh, risk. Um, but that might be interconnected, right? Fun and risk. Um, so great to yeah. hear. <laughs> All right. Uh, let, let, let's uh, stay with you for uh, a minute or two. So as I learned, you spent nearly two decades, right, in the startup world, um, which yeah. is a world without, at least oftentimes, right, without many processes, guardrails, governance, and so on. Surely this is not 100% true for all the startups out there, um, but still. Uh, and now you're responsible for running an innovation program at City Ventures, being the director, which operates in a highly regulated environment, right? So my first question to you is really simple, Bob, why? Oh, that is a, uh, that, that's a great question. Um, it probably takes uh, too long to answer that, but I'll give you a little, uh, little feedback yeah. on the, the why thing. Uh, ultimately, it started as I really needed to break from the startup world. Mm-hmm. That last opportunity I talked about was brutal. It was hard physically, mentally, emotionally, and even financially. And I knew I couldn't do another startup. So I figured I needed to uh, kind of apply what I did in not necessarily a more stable environment because I don't necessarily value stability. I just needed to do it in an environment where I could kind of recuperate, recharge my batteries, sharpen my sword, so to speak. And the expectation is that I was going to kind of roll off in like nine to 18 months Mm -hmm. and then go off and do another startup. But somehow uh, what I didn't take into account, I kind of fell in love with the idea of corporate innovation. Uh, and yes, it comes with all the stuff that you talked about. It's uh, City is a, a large, old organization. It's risk averse. Uh, it's highly regulated. Um, and yet there's such a great opportunity to use City's assets, the brand, the reach, the subject matter expertise, the access to clients, mm-hmm. um, and do all of that entrepreneurial stuff I'd spent 18 years doing. Uh, so I really like the environment within which I'm operating, even though it is different than the startup world. Okay, and for the audience we have that does not op- operate in uh, highly regulated environments, c- can you give us a sense of what it means to be responsible for corporate environment in such uh, for corporate innovation in such an environment? Yeah, so uh, it's got a lot of the same characteristics um, that I saw in the startup world. So you have mm-hmm. to be hyper focused on solving a very important client problem. That doesn't go away. You also have to do it in a way that's really good for the business, and it's going to have that economic impact that I talked about. But there's this whole other thing that you've got to apply to it. They've got to make sure that you're in line with what we refer to as all of our control partners. And it's not necessarily like one group that weighs in on what we can and cannot do. It's more like 14 different independent conversations that you have with, whether it be legal, risk, Mm -hmm, compliance, mm -hmm. fair lending, et cetera, et cetera, and trying to synthesize and incorporate all their points of view into the vision that you're trying to take into the market. So like I said, it's similar, uh, but it's got this added element. Um, so it's, uh, it's a different environment within which to, uh, to operate. Uh, I was actually sold early on uh, that it will be like building startups inside a city. And within <laughs> three weeks, I knew it wasn't that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because there are similarities, but it's yeah. really a different animal. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm excited to, to really tackle that challenge because I do believe that we're, we're still in early stages mm-hmm. of real corporate innovation. I think it was, um, you know, almost like theater esque yeah, for a while, yeah. not necessarily impact seeking. But these days, there are a lot of folks that are trying to figure out the right way to do it and and the right way to have great impact. All right, and it, it's just you know con- going to continue to accelerate, right? Um, that that's what also we see in the recent um, months. So that that's an exciting spot to be in, and a great great combination of different um, environmental factors. Um, t- talking at about city. Um, you know, in general, and also City Ventures, to which we'll come in a minute. What, what programs do exist um, at City? You know, at, uh, um, um, when you look at innovation, so is this City Ventures obviously the venturing arm, right? But what else is kind of organized and existing at City to make innovation happen? Yeah, the, the right way to think about it is City is a massive organization. We've got over two hundred thousand employees, eighty billion in revenue. Uh, we're in virtually every country on the planet, um, and uh, as a result. We've got so many different approaches to innovation. 
Uh, and a really important element is to understand that large, complex organizations need different ways to innovate because different innovation programs have different kind of pros and cons and processes and such. Uh, and so, like, it's important to do a lot of different types. There is no right type of innovation. Uh, but in doing so, it's really important for those groups to understand who they are and how to network at least loosely, if not in a more coordinated way, so that you're kind of learn, learning from each other and sharing resources and, and insights. Uh, and so we've got the corporate innovation program that I'm part of that's kind of outside the business. Uh, mm -hmm. We've got innovation programs that are similar to us inside the business. We've got innovation lab networks that are working on kind of advanced technology. Uh, and so when you put them together, it's a, a large sprawling uh, kind of innovation ecosystem within City. Uh, each focused on trying to do best by city's customers and deal with disruption and growth at the same time. Yeah. Okay. So you guys do have an entire portfolio of innovation portfolios, actually, right? Coming out of different streams of different initiatives of different um, regions, obviously. Okay. V v very interesting. H by the way, how is this all governed, right? Is there, you know, somebody overseeing all that stuff or is it that basically you say whatever works in the market and whatever is good for the customer ultimately wins the race? No, no. Governance is a super important element yeah. uh, within any pro uh, innovation program in a large enterprise, partially because there is always has to be that voice of our control partner ecosystem to make sure that we're operating in line with where our regulators want us to be. Uh, so there's governance from that point of view. And there's also like marshalling the right capital towards the right strategic initiatives. So it's not that yeah. these programs compete with each other, but they have to be coordinated so that we're not spending the same dollar in two different places. Uh, and so that element uh, is super important. Generally speaking, sometimes there are like organization structures to try to do that. But what I found in my experience, it usually comes down to very strong minded, innovation focused leaders right. within the organization to make sure that that's happening in the right way. So I give a ton of respect to those individuals that are trying to take these disparate programs and keep them together yeah. going in the right direction in line with where our control partners need them to be. Yeah. And, and would you would you argue that governance ultimately hampers innovation or at least slows down speed in innovation execution or not? Yeah. So there's a, there's an analogy that, that I've heard at City that um, uh, going back to the brakes on cars, uh, the, the mm -hmm. analogy says that the reason why cars have brakes is not to make them go slow, is to allow them to go fast. Right. And so like if you were had a car, no brakes and needed to turn, you'd have to just always go slow so you can make those turns. I don't believe in that analogy <laughs> at all. Uh, I do believe that a lot of the processes in place are to slow things down. Uh, there's no way that a company with like City that's got the respect of its clients, it's got the, the accountability of a financial services system that we can move fast and break things. That is not the right method. Yeah. So we do need these things in place to govern the way that we're bringing innovation to our customers and into the market. Um, so the goal is to make sure that we're only slowing down to the extent necessary to make sure that we're adhering to all of the things that we need to adhere to and not slowing down for other reasons. So there's a little bit of art in that. Uh -huh. um, so we want to move as fast as possible, but not fast enough to break things. Yeah, yeah, understood. Makes perfect sense. Now let's move to City Ventures um, for a while. So, you know, Bob, be being a seasoned entrepreneur and innovation professional, um, as you mentioned before, um, you know, you're um, director of innovation within City Ventures. Can you tell me a bit more about City Ventures? First of all, so how does City Ventures support um, the city business in general, but also why does City actually need an internal incubator at all? It's a great, uh, great question. So let me break down City Ventures. There's two major components to, to ventures. One is a venture investment arm. Uh, these guys have been around longer than the incubation program, and their goal is to put money in into the ecosystem. So they look for startup companies outside of city uh, that have some at least orthogonal connection to what it is we do, and in some cases, a very tight connection to what we do. Uh, but their goal is to kind of put money into these companies and get great returns, and along the way, commercialize that integration with, with city's business, hopefully generating more value for us, either by reducing costs or by growing revenues, whatever. The incubation arm, and what they do is probably spend 80% of their time outside the company and 20% of their time inside the company connecting to those business units. The incubation side of City Ventures is almost opposite. 
we spend at least 80% of our time working with the business partners inside the business, understanding their business strategy, understanding the disruption that's going on. And then we turn about 20% of our eye outside to understand how is that problem being solved? Are there partners that we can work with, et cetera? Uh, and so there's a really good symbiotic relationship between the venture investing arm and the incubation arm. Now, the reason why we exist is like this is one model where these two groups sit outside of the business. Yes. Um, and the, the argument is that by being outside the business, that we are not beholden to the production stuff. So if you give a business that's running a production business a dollar, it's always going to go to service the existing clients. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard to carve out that dollar to throw in a risky way at a potential opportunity in the future. So our goal is to be that vehicle that we're not beholden to all of this business as usual investment that has to be made and focus on the existing thing. Uh, the other thing that we provide is a, you know, a different point of view. Um, because we're not in the business, we get to kind of think differently and almost ask the question, well, if this was a tech company, how would they attack this market opportunity? Uh, and we may come up with a different answer. Um, the right answer is usually in the middle. It's a good collaboration with like outside thinkers and people that have the, the deep subject matter expertise in that BAU. Uh, and so that's the, the type of relationships that we ultimately look and seek to form. Does that make sense? It, it, to totally. How, how do you basically recruit uh, staff? Do you recruit internally 100% or do you look for outsiders joining uh, City Ventures? How do you do that? What, what mindsets and capabilities are you looking for typically that shall join your team? Yeah, we need uh, we need both because mm -hmm. like navigating city is complicated. I'd say uh, I already said like one third of the effort is to make sure that we're managing those control processes. Yeah. But there's another third that's focused on managing the organization, understanding how it operates and who makes decisions and, and where budgets are and, and how to like graduate something from an incubator into the business. And that does require a lot of contextual knowledge about who city is, how they operate and who's who. But we also need that fresh outside in point of view. And that's generally where our EIR program or entrepreneur in residence program comes from. Uh, generally, we're taking outsiders and putting them to the role. Uh, we, we love when they've got an orientation around what our business is or may have subject matter expertise in the domain they may, may be incubating, uh, but ultimately want people that can think like a startup and has have experience building companies and products from scratch. Yeah. So it's a good kind of middle ground of both new as well as existing talent. All right. Sounds great, Bob. Now, can you take us on a quick journey of how the uh, City Ventures program has evolved um, over time? For example, you know, how long did it take to get the first version up and running? And maybe along the way, what kind of growth hacks have you used? Or at least what were some of the key building blocks to build this quickly over time? Yeah, that's a, uh, a great question. Uh, so the formation of the program kind of predated me. So it goes back about five and a half, six years. Uh, and City Ventures did what a lot of corporations do. They turned to outside partners and they brought in an innovation agency to implement their version of an innovation program. Uh, and a lot of it started with, as you'd expect, um, teaching people design thinking to get them to think differently. Uh, it was kind of creating an innovation process, hosting idea sessions where people from the business can come up with ideas about what city could or should be doing. Uh, so it really began in those, uh, those very early stages. Um, and then that probably took about a year to really formalize uh, both the staffing and establishing like where the budget was going to come from and where it would sit organizationally. Um, but then within a year, maybe a little a uh, little more, the business then began stepping up and saying, hey, where's that billion dollar business that you said you were going to generate through this new incubation program? Uh, and we realized that uh, ultimately that's where we have to end up. We knew where we were starting, but there's a lot of work to kind of fill in uh, fill in the gap. Uh, and the way I look at it is that uh, every year since we've evolved or iterated the program, mm -hmm. uh, and those changes come from two places, either uh, lessons learned about what was working or what was not working, but also really recalibrating based on where the business is. Because city's business, if you look at it today versus where it was five years ago, it's in a dramatically different place. Uh, and so yeah. every year we would sit down and think about what we needed to do differently uh, based on those two particular factors. And so there was a lot of evolution that went on. Uh, some of the hacks that we, we came up with, number one, um, the establishment of a budget uh, for innovation efforts we recognized needed to be independent of the core business, right? If you mm -hmm. give that uh, business the dollar, it's going to use it for the core operations. So establishing 
and, and approach to budgeting these things was super important. Number two, we did set up a, a governance committee, uh, so to speak. Uh, so like whenever we had a cool opportunity we we're working on, we wanted to make it sure we put it in front of the business to have them weigh in on what was right about it, what was wrong about it, and have them guide. Uh, so those two factors, the budgeting, um, the um, uh, the governance uh, control process, uh, as well as the identification of talent. Uh, that was a, a really important thing. Um, not everybody that works for a large company are cut out for tackling kind of early stage, innovative minded projects. Uh, you have to yeah. find those individuals that have the right kind of attitude uh, that are okay with risk, that are okay with failure because that happens sometimes. Uh, and so kind of lining up that third leg, budget, control partner stuff, as well as uh, as talent took us a while to kind of work out. And again, we, we continue to evolve all uh, all elements. Right, but that is great advice. Now, on the, on, the, on the other side, can you also talk about some of the pitfalls that you encountered during that journey? Yeah, so uh, I think um, uh, one of the, the challenges is to figure out how close or far away the innovation program should be from the core business. Um, at, I think at some point, uh, the program mm -hmm. was too far outside the business. And as a result, uh, even when we were working on what we thought were good ideas or what employees in the field thought were good ideas, they weren't always closely aligned with what the strategy of the business was. And so as a result, we felt like we were not well aligned enough. Uh, and so we needed to take steps closer uh, to make sure that we were aligned with the strategy without like getting too close to be caught up in those day-to-day -day kind of production kind of attitudes. Uh, and so and like that's interesting. That, uh, May I just ask you, this is really, really interesting. H how did you find out that you're not kind of closely linked with strategy? Did, did you get these signals from the team, from the business? How did you find out? That's really interesting. Yeah, it's uh, so, uh, you know, one of our processes were for us to kind of in the early stages own mm -hmm. most of the efforts to do the research as to like what the opportunity was and develop the product and things like that. And when we would turn to a a stakeholder and say, do you like how we're spending our money? A lot of them were like, yeah, it sounds great. But then by the end of the project, when we said, hey, can we spend your money on this? A lot of the time, the answer was no, because it was not in okay. the strategic direction of that particular sponsor. And so trying to figure out how like, we've got the flexibility to move with our own resources, but have it governed as if we're using the resources. And in fact, You know, ultimately, the business does pay for every innovation program, you know, as uh, we're not a revenue generating organization that's self-sufficient. So as a result, they are paying a tax. Everybody's paying a tax to some extent. So we need to make sure that we're spending those dollars in line with how they would, even if we are marshalling those dollars. Brilliant. All right. This is super helpful. All right. And um, okay, now th this might be this might be a tough question, right? But, you know, how do how do you actually you know, bring or maybe compress or shrink things down to a level like um, like an MVP or an, an MLP, minimal level of the product, whatever. And w when you actually know it's the right time to, you know, um, asking for more money, for more investment, and then ultimately also start with in-market testing. So do, do, you got, do you guys apply something like metered funding or how do you typically set this up um, before you actually start market testing and then decide to go or not to go with further investments? Yeah, this is, uh, you're right. It's a hard, really hard question. Yeah. I wish I had a really easy answer. Um, we've not developed any method. Uh, to me, a lot of yeah. this comes down to seasoning and experience, finding right that right sweet spot. Yeah. Um, huge props to uh, Eric Reist writing the Lean Startup book. I would say the treatment of MVP in that book was probably the weakest out, out of everything else. And there have been a lot of really smart people that have added the capability of, you know, not MVP, it's the light product, whatever. Um, and so there's a lot of great knowledge base there. But in terms of execution, right. a lot of it does come down to understanding the context within which you're operating and trying to come up with the smallest ask to prove the most, um, uh, provide the most amount of information to get to that next step. Uh, and so uh, it's a really massive judgment call. Um, you know, what, one of the things I've found, like even though I've done this so many times, so many years, like it takes a long time to figure out what those hypotheses are that are in play that you're kind of mm -hmm. taking for granted and isolating virtually everything else and trying to get that thing out in the marketplace. Uh, it's a really hard thing to do uh, because I don't know why we, we have a tendency to put more and more into that. 
um, than it really yeah. needs to be. And so that isolation of our biggest hypothesis is, is one of the phrases that we use to try to say, is this the right MVP? Um, but on top of that, then we also have to consider all of the other stakeholders' points of view. So even if we wouldn't put a lot of like production-oriented stuff around it, if that's the thing that's going to make our control partners comfortable, then we have to yeah. bolt that onto our MVP, even as a startup guy, if I didn't call that an MVP feature. Uh, so it's uh, like a, you know, understanding context. It's a lot of synthesis, um, and then it's trial and, and, and experimentation. Uh, it's building the, the muscles and the intuition yeah. as to where you want to start on the next one. Yeah, and I guess this is also why you need a lot of uh, experience, you know, in the team and in the, in, in the process, right? So um, this, this is really about business and not just about, you know, as you say, collect some ideas and yeah, let's make some happy mock-ups, point them on the wall and say, well, no, we're actually, we're looking for the next million, well, maybe even next billion um, dollar thing here. So um, that, that's why I call it grinding. And I guess nothing beats yeah. experience in that process, right? Yeah, I, I agree. And, and there's an interesting yeah. thing with uh, corporate innovation that's different than startups. The cost of putting something into production is a lot higher for us than it is for a startup. Um, and mm -hmm. so oftentimes in the startup world, just get it out there, get production code in the hand of users and learn from that um, because the cost of doing so for them is really low. For us, there's a lot that goes into it. And so we have to develop a lot more techniques before we get to that point to prove that hypotheses and yeah. collect feedback. And so we do a lot of qualitative research. We do quantitative research. We do a lot of clickable prototype development just with to play with product concepts. We do a lot internally before we get it out into production. Uh, and so there is a, a big shift of effort and focus pre-production for us um, compared to uh, other environments. Yeah, yeah, it makes perfect sense. And um, uh, Bob, how do you define success um, specifically at City Ventures? I, I'm not sure if there is any metric, right? But uh, how, how do you see and when would you say something was successful, some venture um, that you deployed to the market or whatever? Um, you have any, 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 any opinion to that? Mm. Yeah, that is a uh, the hard hard thing. Another kind of hard question is uh, success metrics or KPIs. Um, so I, I could share a little bit about the uh, the challenge. Ultimately, you know, by my definition of innovation, as along with my team members, it's all about having impact, economic impact. Um, however, there, you know, we um, the control of meeting that goal isn't always in our hand. There are so many yeah. things that may prevent us from actually getting into production and having economic impact. Uh, and so it's really hard to set us up with a success metric where half of it is totally out of our control. And we did that early on. Um, and so as a result, we began shifting to say, well, why don't we identify preliminary KPIs that we do control? That if we know that we do these things, um, then we have a higher likelihood of having impact in the future. Um, and those would be things like problem spaces that we've been exploring, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, clickable prototypes that we're developing, white papers we've written about the concepts that we're exploring. Um, but ultimately, to me, that felt like we were working on a lot of innovation theater related things. Mm -hmm. And it's easy to take your eye off the impact side when your KPIs are oriented around those early stage things. So to this day, I will always hold myself accountable, even though I've got I don't have full control. Uh, over getting stuff into marketplace and having that economic impact. But you need to have some of those leading indicators, right? That's why you have introduced all these early stage indicators. You at least need to kind of have a good sense and at least some evidence of, is this going into the right direction? Are we doing more? Are we doing better? Um, but ultimately, of course, economic impact is maybe the one KPI um, where that, that's kind of showing if you got it right or not. Okay. Yeah, and, and, right. we, and we do have the, those indicators, uh, but those right. are not what we define as success. Those are necessary, but not sufficient to say we've been successful on a program. And we do break up any one of these projects into multiple phases. Uh, and so at each step that we take, uh, we look at these opportunities across a, a number of different matrices from a funding perspective, a client engagement perspective, a technology feasibility, alignment with the business strategy. And so as things progress, They've got to progress on all of these axes at the same time. Maybe not equally. On some projects, we may be heavily, more heavily oriented towards client satisfaction. On this one, we may be more oriented around technical feasibility. Um, but they all eventually have to make progress on all of those fronts before we can consider it a success. Um, and we use this phrase of graduating something from the program into the business, because that's our ultimate goal, 
Like we're always going to learn a lot based on exploring these problem spaces, but we're only successful when we've successfully moved either the de development of a new business or a new product into the business so that we can go off and uh, attack the next problem space. Mm -hmm, true. Understood. Okay. Th thanks for sharing. Now, um, can you maybe share, obviously, non-confidential data, right? Non-confidential information. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe one or two real-life ventures or venture examples um, that you've recently been working on? Uh, sure. Uh, so uh, there's a, a project called Proximity. Uh, it ended up being spun out of City. So it's a, a public um, company. Uh, it's not publicly traded, but it's in the public outside of uh, outside of city. Uh, this began inside of the City Ventures program uh, a number of years ago, and it came from two guys, really smart guys that sat in our custody business. Um, and it was all about identifying the fact that a lot of proxy voting, um, even to this day, is manually intensive and done with paper. And they said, why can't we come up with a digital way of managing proxy voting for the customers that we're doing custody for. And so it started with a really simple idea and we brought it through the process, all of these stage gates, we gave it some funding, uh, had some success metrics we hit, we got in front of customers and they seemed to like the idea and so we built a product. Uh, and ultimately, what we realized along the way that this wasn't necessarily a city problem that we are solving, this was an industry problem that we were solving. And as a result, we determined the right strategic path for that is for that thing to operate outside of city um, independently uh, so that it wouldn't be kind of hampered by just city's point of view and it could take on the points of view of the uh, of the industry uh, and to this day it's a, a booming company uh, they're doing really well every quarter they're rolling out kind of new successes um, as they shift from not just worrying about proxy voting but digital shareholder communication which is a broader strategy uh, and that's a theme that I saw even in the startup world. You know, you focus on an acute problem. And if you do that, then you've kind of won the right to tackle bigger problems. Uh, and you get to evolve and kind of grow from that point of view. But crushing it with a specific client and a specific problem in mind uh, is super important. So that was uh, a project I was involved with, in, with um, that I'm really, uh, really proud of that's going to this day. Cool. All right. Congratulations. Really, sound, that sounds like a huge success and still um, ongoing. All right. Beautiful. Uh, so that was the past. Now let's talk future. What, what is kind of next for City Ventures? Can you share just, you know, what, what's on your radar um, for the next maybe couple of months and years? Yeah. So I, I think we've, uh, we've done a really good job of kind of working on the muscles required and the capabilities required um, and the processes required to do good corporate innovation. Um, as I, I mentioned, Like one of the things that we worked on every single year is getting closer and closer to attacking strategic problems for City. Uh, and so it was just uh, a couple months ago uh, that City did its first investor day in a very long time and laid out a really bold strategy uh, from the point of view of City's relatively new CEO, Jane Frazier. Uh, and she is taking some really bold um, moves in terms of where the growth areas for uh, for city uh, are in the future. Uh, and so I predict, even though we haven't kind of implemented the right structure yet, I suspect that all of this muscle and capability and process that we've developed will be acutely focused on those things that Jane and Mark Mason, our CFO, kind of laid out during investor day. Uh, so it's really important to make sure that if we're doing this stuff, uh, it's in line with that, that, that strategic in intent. Uh, so uh, I suspect Uh, that that's uh, you know a really important part of our future is to figure out what role we play in helping Jane's vision uh, come to yeah. fruition. Okay, yeah, I understood. Um, and uh, Bob, we've come quite far uh, in this episode. It just felt like we're just started talking, but I guess we're already quite far uh, with that episode. But before we finish it, um, with Yeah, with, with all that you know today about both the startup world and also the highly regulated corporate world, um, I'd be interested in hearing that. What guidance would you give to people that are still in the startup world today? Mm. Uh, so I, I try my best to stay connected to the uh, startup world. It is hard. Mm -hmm. Like when you're in a large corporation, you know, you're uh, intensely focused on large problems like city is facing. Uh, but I do try to kind of maintain through advisorship or uh, just personal relationships. Um, so uh, I try to keep my feet wet. Uh, if I were to look back at where I was uh, and what I know now and kind of share that, 
Uh, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that when you're in the startup, uh, it's really easy to kind of look at yourself as a lone wolf trying to tackle a big problem on your own. Uh, but I think in hindsight, when, as I look at the, the role that young startups play, even in relation to what city needs to get done. So we've got a lot of great partnerships uh, with, uh, with young startup companies. Um, there is an ecosystem that every startup plays in. And understanding what that ecosystem or that market landscape is and mapping yourself against all of those players uh, is really important to understand the context because you never know if that you know, other company out there is going to be a competitor, whether it's going to be a partner, whether it's going to be a channel to new customers, whether it's going to be a, a future acquisition target. Um, and so understanding context of the market and the ecosystem is as important as all of that energy that a startup is putting towards that kind of lone wolf feel of building the thing themselves. Uh, so I think if I went back and did it again, I'd operate with that, that, that contextual mindset in a way that I didn't have uh, back then. So it's beware of the lone wolf trap. That's brilliant. That's brilliant advice. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And finally, Bob, looking back on your career at City, um, I'd have to ask you this, right? What, what would you say was your greatest innovation rockstar moment? Uh, it's a great, uh, great question. Um, I think if I were to name it, uh, there's a, a, a site that we launched last year called Bridge Built by City. Uh, it's a new platform uh, to connect uh, small businesses with uh, small to mid-sized banks. Um, and City kind of came up with the idea and, and we launched it. Um, and I'd say that it was a, a great moment, not because it was the hardest thing I ever did and we were ultimately successful. It's just that it went more smoothly than I ever anticipated a corporate innovation program going. Um, and, you know, everything kind of lined up really well. The budget lined up. The relationship with the sponsor was very good. Uh, the deployment into production was great. Our relationship with our control partners was really, really positive. Uh, and I think it was a reflection of all of the things that we learned along the way and applied in the right way that things went smoothly. Uh, so I was really proud of the work that we did. Uh, I also learned a little bit about like how to attack multiple problems at the same time. Uh, so this is a very valuable platform uh, for our customers uh, and our partners. Um, but you know we also were able to kind of introduce a number of uh, MDIs um, minority depository institutions on the platform at the same time. So not only are we doing economic good, but we're doing social good at the same time. And we found that kind of elusive double bottom line uh, as we launched Bridge Built by City. Um, and to be able to do that within a, a company like City that has uh, has such a commitment uh, to those things is, was really important to me. So I feel like like we accomplished something uh, really symbolic in terms of where City is now and where we're going in the future. So I was uh, super happy. All right. Well, that feels like an awesome rock star moment. Thanks for sharing. And uh, with this, we wrap up this episode. So, so Bob, it was a pleasure to listen to you. Thanks again for joining. Hey, thanks for having me. And I'll even kind of more broadly say thank you for doing what you do. Because uh, as, uh, as a corporate innovator, it's super important for us to work with folks outside the organization. We need that continual stream of like different thinking and you know, understanding of trends and, and support. Uh, so uh, thanks for bringing all of that to the table with uh, you and your organization. Super important. Happy to do so. And uh, let's definitely keep in touch. Uh, and uh, yeah, thanks to everybody listening or watching. If you like the show, then leave us a rating or a review and share the podcast with colleagues and coworkers, if you will. And if you want to get in touch, uh, simply shoot us a message at info at innovationrockstars.show. Now that's it. Thanks for your time. See you in the next episode. Take care and bye bye. was Innovation Rockstar Bob Petrie, Director of Innovation at City Ventures. If you want to learn more about corporate innovation, or if you'd simply like to give us feedback on this episode, feel free to email us at info at innovationrockstars.show. For more inspiring innovation stories, visit our website at www.innovationrockstars.show or browse through our Innovation Rockstars channel on all major podcast platforms. And while you are here, please leave us a rating for our show. 